Imagine spending three cold winters in Antarctica where the average temperature is minus 76 below. This is Robert Manny, host of Guys Guys TV, and this week my special guest is Wayne L. White, who wrote a book about it called Cold. It all starts right here, right now on Guys Guys TV. You can also catch me on KCAA Radio here in Southern California and Guys Guys Radio, my worldwide podcast. Guys Guys TV, Guys Guys Radio, thanks for your support. Okay, Guys Guys Radio, the interview portion of our show. And today we're going to talk about the cold, colder and coldest. My special guest, his name is Wayne L. White. He's written a book called Cold, Three Winters at the South Pole. In this book, he documents his time in the extreme elements and offers a unique perspective on the United States Antarctic program at the South Pole. Uh, Wayne's a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps. He served as a civilian contractor in these assignments uh, uh, and also other assignments around the globe for more than 25 years. And he had spent, once again, three years in the Antarctic program at the South Pole. That means winters, long winters, short summers. He's conducted solar expeditions to New Guinea, the Amazon, Africa. He's a member of the Explorer Clubs of New York and the Adventure Club of L.A. and received the 2020 Adventure of the Year Award from the Adventures Club in L.A. He's an amazing guy. It's a really terrific story. I'm so pleased that he's here on Guys Guys Radio. Welcome to the show, Wayne L. White. Robert, Welcome. I'm thrilled to be here. I've, uh, I've watched some of your shows and I think you, you produce a wonderful product and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. Okay, let's start right at the beginning and thank you for the kind words. Um, your mission, how did you, you traveled around the world, you were a Marine and you did those trips to New Guinea and places like that. How did you end up in the South Pole in a civilian contractor's role? Robert, that's a very interesting, interesting question in that I am actually kind of a tropical guy. I've always enjoyed the tropics, the warmer places in the world. I spent many years out on tropical islands, of working as a civilian contractor running remote tropical islands. And so my big, uh, my big attraction to Antarctica was actually the, uh, what was known as the heroic age of exploration where we had Captain Scott and Paul Robinson and Ernest Shackleton down there trying to be first to the pole. Uh, the great struggle that these men went through to be first to the pole or to even just arrive at the pole, that was my true uh, attraction to the South Pole. So how did you, uh, uh, a, lot of, uh, a good portion of your book, you talk about um, the interviewing process and the screening people for your team. But how did you get selected or invited or express interest in, in this and end up getting there? Well, one thing, one thing that was different about my background than most is that while I did initially have this Antarctic program experience, I had I had experience as a leader in remote sites all over the world. And that's unusual. And I remember my boss talking to me about that, uh, saying that people just didn't have my level of experience being around the world in remote sites for 20 years and um so so uh because i had that experience i was interviewed and then you know as i as i mentioned in the book when he asked uh, my boss asked me during the interview why do you want this position i said because i can't go to mars and it was my feeling at the time that uh, working at the south pole particularly in that leadership position was as close as i would ever get to a mars mission and that turned out to be true. So what exactly was the, the mission? You went there three years. I don't I think it was two years consecutively, then a year off, and then back a year if I'm if I'm unless it was three years. Correct me on that. And then what exactly was the mission? You were in a civilian role. Okay. You were overseeing 40 yeah. or 50 people. Tell us about that. Right. Yeah. Um, I actually ended up spending uh, three winters and two summers and then a part of the summer. A winter there at the South Pole is February 15th to around November 1st. So winter is most of the year. Uh, the summer is uh, from uh, November 1st to about February 15th. So I ended up spending a year there, a complete year, over a year, going back uh, to the U.S., recruiting and interviewing another team to head down the next year uh, for the, you know, with a year break. I ended up then having that crew uh, 
the 2019 crew. And then I did a back-to-back -back winter for the last one, the 2020, where I uh, left for just a few weeks at the end of 2019 and had to come right back for another, you know, nearly 11 months there during 2020, the COVID year, which was a, 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 an amazing experience. Uh, yes, I worked as a contractor, civilian contractor, working for, def they were Defense Department contracts, although we work for the, uh, uh, the, the uh, National Science Foundation through the, you know, the U.S. Uh, Antarctic Program. So we were contractors that supported the U.S. Antarctic Program and the National Science Foundation, which is a wonderful organization, was who funded our contract. Okay. Let's talk, let's add a little context for those who are unfamiliar with what life is like on the South Pole and Antarctica, because I found all of these eye-opening for me. Uh, 10 degrees is the warmest temperature on record there in the summer. As Wayne mentioned, the summers are from um, November through February, beginning of February. It's extremely dry there, um, 0 0.03 versus the typical humidity of in the 50s and up in the northern hemisphere or you know closer to the equator summers once again uh they're light a lot of sunshine in the summer and darkness pretty much from february through october which must be a challenge the area is 9300 feet above sea level but feels higher due to barometric pressure uh, it's mostly a desert uh not that much snow but it never melts so the snow piles up on itself and then the third station that's been built down there now has a capacity to be able to be raised because of the snow that keeps piling up underneath. It's used for astronomy. Um, of course, the internet connections are tricky. Uh, staffing's a real challenge. And uh, most of the folks are pretty much unreachable for nine months of the year. Did I miss anything there, Wayne, or anything? Uh, no, you correct? really, Robert, you, you explained that very, very well. Uh, some of the points are Antarctica is the highest, driest, coldest place on the planet. I've also heard the windiest, but I don't know that for sure. Highest, driest, coldest is true. All those things matter. That altitude, 9,300 feet, you're sitting on nearly two miles of ice, which then sits on an old continent, nearly two miles below. And the issue with that being that you've got 9,300 feet uh, foot altitude, and then this physiological factor that occurs due when we have low barometric pressure that will actually make it, the human body feel that it's over 12,000 feet. So a person flies from McMurdo to the South Pole, and they can, they can immediately enter a high altitude sickness situation, and it happens all the time. Um, yes, and the, and the seasons are just as you explained. Uh, there's a, uh, the, 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 the summertime is 24 hours of of daylight, the average temperature is you know probably minus ten or twenty somewhere around there for the summer, but the winter, which is most of the year, the average temperature is around minus seventy six Fahrenheit. That would be your average, and it'll get colder than minus a hundred um, a few times through the winter. So in that darkness and through that long winter, and with no way of getting out of the station, you deal with certain human factors that I've never seen quite like uh, as at the South Pole. Let's talk a little bit about um, the screening for the type of individuals that are that go down there, because I want to know kind of uh, where the people come from. Are they from all over the world? Can everybody play in the ice box together there based on their nationalities? Is China and Russia involved at all? Um, what criteria do you look for? Because it's a big portion of the book about how you screen people, because you don't want to get somebody who goes down there and gets wasted all the time and becomes a real problem yeah. with a bad temper or doesn't get along with people because you're stuck there together in a lot of darkness for many months and a lot of most of the time indoors. Um, how did you manage all of that? I mean, you did a masterful job in screening. I think it was one of the greatest skills you need to have down there. What were you looking for? What are the people like? Where did they come from? What, what, what who are these people? Okay, that, that is a fantastic question. I put a lot of that in the book. The book's a primer. Anybody that wants to join the U.S. Antarctic program, there's nothing better out there that gives what I think is straight information on getting into the program, what you face, what we're looking for, and um, maybe answers to a couple of questions. But uh, the, the thing is, is that it's the U.S. Antarctic program, so it is confined. U.S. citizens will be the majority of the people that are working on the Antarctic support contract. The eight scientists that go down can vary in nationality. We had Germans, Japanese, um, let's see, I'm sure there was Canadian, uh, there's a couple more. We didn't have Russians, we didn't have Chinese. 
uh, but we all work together. And the screening process is, is truly an interesting situation. Now, I had spent years out on remote islands where all I could do is interview by the telephone. And more than once, I was uh, uh, surprised when the real person arrived that I had interviewed and came across so well on the phone. And then in, when you saw the person, it was like, oh my God, what did I do? Um, uh, phone is just not enough. And so what we found after one particularly bad year that occurred, not a year I was there, but a year prior, um, you had to have a face-to-face -face interview in Denver to be both primary or even an alternate. We had, you had to actually face a panel face-to-face and what was cool about the panel was you had uh, uh, four or five people. Most all had great Antarctic experience. Most all had wintered in the past. And then we would look for certain traits in people. Some, as I mentioned in the book, and some of it's kind of humorous, you know, uh, we were looking for people who could coexist, peacefully coexist, but also remember this. Now, I've interviewed for years, and one thing that I've learned from all my interviewing is that person sitting on the other side of the table wants something. They want a job. They want a job. And in this case, they want to go to the South Pole. It's very hard to get to the South Pole and very expensive if you want to go as a tourist. So I have something they want. Many people will say about anything to get that job. You have to go into it kind of knowing that, that they're going to be the most pleasing person that you'd ever want to meet across the table with a suit and tie on or a nice dress in that Denver office. Later, in the darkness of winter, another person might emerge. And I saw that a few times, and I, I do mention that in the book, some humorous situations with that. But that was the beauty of having a panel. And I do mention in the book, the one thing that my first year was excruciating for me to interview my crew members because I had not been there. And I could talk about where I'd been in the world, but I had not been to the South Pole. So when that crew member asked the panel, what does minus 100 feel like? They got a blank stare from me because I had no idea yet. And it was excruciating to be on that edge. But but having the panel and having, and, and that was the first step. Now, we used to have a psychological exam. We, we found the psychological exam was, was weeding out, was catching. Many of the mechanics were having a hard time passing the psychological exam. And so... Um, People, we had one guy, he, he liked NASCAR and he liked, he lived in Texas and he had already worked in McMurdo for years and he fails a psychological exam. Now, I don't know, NASCAR, Texas, he, he's already worked at McMurdo and he fails this thing. So, you know, after we, we, we and, and there's something with mechanics or something, the way they work, that I think made them look maybe like they were maybe a little, um, not very sociable people during the, during this, this interview and in the, in the MMPI exam. So we actually had that stopped, and what we put in place was a week of this team building, where we took them up into the mountains of Colorado, did building experiments, put them together, doing building things, doing things, working together, where you could watch people, and that to me was 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 an eye opener. You know, it was much better to see people and how they work. Um, and I and I think and I found that team building to be uh, to be uh, something very valuable. Now, you mentioned things like alcohol and and. You know, I, I mentioned it in my book, alcohol is the bane of the remote sites. It's one of the biggest you know, problems that you're going to have. Um, the U.S. Antarctic program is, is no, is, is uh, you know, case in point. And for the most part, I think people handle themselves very, very, very well. But the South Pole, I always made it clear with my crews that should we have a problem, an alcohol-related incident, we could be the crew that got the pole dry. Because that, that's how they would have handled it. The U.S. Antarctic program, the NSF would have said, uh, you know, if we if there would have been a catastrophic occurrence no boats, in the right? South Pole, it, off, right? it would have gone, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. just such as the North Slope in Alaska. Is, and there's a reason for it. So most people handled it well. Some people not as well, particularly in the Got summers. It. But here's the thing about that. It's hard to tell how much a person drinks. There's no test for it. So there's a thing on, the, on their medical form that says, how much do you drink a week? And what we found was, if the guy said, oh, I have three beers a week, he had three beers a day. That was really how it worked. It, 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 people were always under, under, you know, of um, course, they, they will definitely, you know, not be honest with it. So there's all kinds of things you do, but that team building experience, and then also you put them through a fire training, which is intense with, with going through a, a fire facility where they put you in a fire chamber and get to feel real heat wearing bunker gear because you are the fire department. And then also a medical training. And so by the time you deploy, you've seen a lot of 
Okay. Oh, Wayne, Wayne L. White, my special guest on Guys Guys Radio. The name of the book is Cold, Three Winters at the South Pole. I guess our listeners out there would be asking themselves, what, are, what were the conditions? I mean, there's so many questions, but what were the con- what was the day-to-day life like? What did, the, you know, food? How did you deal with waste? How did you deal with things like music, entertainment, so people weren't crawling up the walls because you're in the dark, you're in, inside most of the time. I want to get to you shortly where you went out outside just about every day, which I think is great and fascinating. Mm-hmm. But just from a logistics standpoint, how did kind of uh, people play in the icebox together there? Yeah, well, the one good thing, it, good or bad, depends how you look at it, is that the summer the winter crew is only around 42 people. The station can hold 150. So it's a 50,000 square foot station. There's a lot of room. There's a lot of activities. Everybody gets their own room. It's a tiny little box with no, you know, we still have communal restrooms, but still there's the privacy that affords. Um, Food is a huge issue. I write about that a lot in my book uh, because it's such a big issue. Always has been from the early Antarctic expeditions from old Amundsen eating his dogs uh, to Captain Scott dying on his return journey, running out of his uh, biscuits and uh, pemmican and such. To this day, it's a huge issue. And I think that the chefs that work at the South Pole are masterful in making food that is all frozen. It has to be frozen, very little fresh, at least not in the winter. I mean, masterful at, at, at producing great dishes. Of course, everybody's different with food. I'm a Marine. I can eat anything. That's one thing my wife does really like, still, <laughs> even after all these years. I will eat anything but there are people who are finicky oh that's another thing you can i used to ask that question during the you know during the interview process about people's food you know and then if they started telling me that they like the gluten-free something 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 and they right. that's not a good thing for this how oh you don't have all those food options you'll be starving down there so food is is a major thing the other thing that's most important that i thought was the activities uh people so the pole people are interesting individuals. They have many, many interests. I mean, they're people, pretty eclectic bunch, different than what I worked around with the Defense Department contracts. Uh, and they have so many interesting facets and things that they do that we had a lot of classes. We had language classes. We had an astronomy class. We had my thing, which was called Adventure Movie Night with Wayne, where I'd show an adventure movie and I would talk about uh, what I knew about the, the certain adventure like Scott's trip to the pole or Amundsen or things I knew about from other things through Africa, things like that. Uh, keeping people busy, keeping people having options, things to do, uh, sporting events, a lot of sporting events, I felt was a good thing. And, and we did a lot of that. So day-to-day life there, the station, we kept it kind of dark. I think people preferred it. The temperatures probably ran around in the 60s. People liked it a little bit cooler, even cooler in some of the rooms. Um, you had frequent contact with the same people every day, all the time. You run into the same people. You eat with the same people. You do things with the same people. And, um, you know, it's something that you you have to, uh, you have to uh, know that that's what your year is going to be like. Now, Wayne, you uh, spent a lot of time, and I, I admire you for this, not only just all, all the things you've done, but particularly when you were in the South Pole, and I think it's a good part of your story is you used to go outside every day, go for walks, go for runs, whatever. And a couple of times, uh, it's dark, I guess, during the winter. It's unbelievably cold. I'm sure you had to, re- I read about you had to relieve yourself both ways a couple of times and like, wow, that's an adventure in itself. And you got lost out there. Um, what was your thinking behind why you went outside and what would be your like plan in, in terms of each time you went outside? Would you say, oh, today I'm going to go right? Every, everything points north. Every direction points north. So how would you decide where you were going to go and how are you going to spend that time out there? And then how you were going to use your experience from that time to help lead your crew? Yeah, Robert, fascinating questions. And the thing is, is I, as the station leader, I was the one responsible for being able to call like bad weather conditions that would prohibit outside travel. And we had people that were outside every day, the science people making their, their rounds for their telescopes, their projects, our maintenance people, our electronics people could be outside every day. As a station's leader, I needed to be able to assess conditions. And I, and I also like being outside every day. So I was outside every day, no matter the conditions in, in the nearly three years I spent there. And, and I ended up keeping track of my miles. And I did that because I'm a long-term runner, at least used to be. 
And so I've logged in you know, over 45,000 miles of running. I went over 10 years once without missing a day, which was kind of stupid, but nonetheless back to the South Pole. So it came natural for me to keep track of my miles. And I ended up with around 4,300 miles and never missed a day. Some of those conditions were truly um, how did how did you let me, let, me, let, me, let me interrupt you how did you because i'm a runner also i've done like three marathons i love running how did you determine how far you could run what did you wear when you were out there for running did you have running shoes you're on the ice how, how did that as a runner talk to me about that yeah. experience my running was mostly all in the summertime when it was 24 hours of light and i would try to run on a packed surface there was a couple of ice road so to speak where equipment had pressed down uh the ice um, the fresh ice to where it's sort of a hard packed surface and i had these incredible pair of running shoes with cleats that actually zipped up over the laces and they were fantastic and i would use those to run um, i never went real far in a run heck there is a in the summertime there is a south pole marathon there's there's uh, fit people who are fit enough to to actually do it they just make multiple loops around the station but 26 miles, which is amazing wow. at that altitude to come in at any time. Now I'm not into I'm not into organized things like that. So it wasn't my thing. My thing was to be alone. I really enjoyed that. But I'll say I need to say this too. So assess conditions and I was incredibly careful. If I go out, if I saw that it was you know conditioned, the phase condition where you couldn't see and I wasn't going to go a certain route. I, I wasn't going to get lost and have the station have a problem. Um, I would walk on the science flag light flag to flag, uh, which could be difficult even on the on those worst days, even doing that. But I needed to at least see, could our science people make it from flag to flag? Was it so bad that you couldn't see the next flag, which could put you in a real bad situation? So I would take that. If the conditions were calmer, I had what I called the grid south route. And that in that route, of course, everything is, is north. But it was, we do have a grid system there, just so we know where things okay. are. And the okay. grid south was the same direction that uh, Captain Scott and Ernest Shackleton would come, basically, okay. and okay. I would go that route. Okay, I was very careful. I'll bet, uh, guys. Guys, radio. My special guest, Wayne L. White. The book is "Cold: Three Winters at the South Pole." What a fascinating conversation we're having. So, how long, if you did get lost out there, Wayne, uh, or anybody's out there, how long could you last before you froze to death? Well. Now, that's a really good one now because I was never lost and I used to practice in the summer during storms. I'd go up from the station and spin around with the storm and then and then get back to the station in almost a white. I could do that. I carried two compasses at all times. I had a fully charged radio, two compasses and two lights too in the wintertime, a regular headlamp and a spare. So I was I got good with the compass. And the company north south means nothing there, but I knew the degrees. I knew where the station was right. by where I was from the degrees, and I could follow that. Uh, so I practiced. I never had that. But you bring up a good, a good question in that every start of winter we would have a a a, a, a training session with all our crew members that would discuss winter travel. And I used to say to the crew, particularly the second year, the third year, when I had so much time thousands of miles outside i would point to the window i'd say there's death outside that window and i wasn't being melodramatic the truth was it, it was dangerous out there um, i was very very uh very careful um i i wanted my crew members to be extremely careful and uh one of the other things i told them is that if they ever wanted someone to walk out with to a I'd go with them if they ever wanted that. I, I was never taken up on that. My folks were quite adept at winter travel, but I was careful. The last thing I wanted to do was get lost out there and have the station have to look for me. That would right, be right. a so bad when, thing. When you were out there um, and your crew also, did you see, was there any wildlife uh, that lived down there in the South Pole? There is nothing at the South Pole. There is, you know, it's interesting. We have the... You go to McMurdo Station or you go to Coastal Stations, uh, Palmer Station, they have killer whales, they have seals, they have sea lions, all, all these cool things. There's nothing but ice for 800 miles, the closest, and 1,000 miles plus in farther you know, directions from that station. Nothing living out there. Okay. So when you're out, the, the just for perspective, the size of the uh, ice landmass, if you will, the South Pole, it's 
is it like bigger than the than Texas, bigger than the United States? How big is it down there? Oh, yeah. That's a good one. I've seen it laid on things and I don't remember it, but it's big. I mean, it's big. It's it's big. Um, and I, I wish I had, that's a good question. It's good that when you see it laid on like a continent, you see how big it is, but mm -hmm. it's big. And at the South Pole, probably the closest thing to us would have been the Vostok station around 700 miles away, or maybe the, maybe the Japanese dome Fuji, I don't know, but nonetheless, there's nothing. You're out there with nothing. And you're out there with, uh, you know, once that last plane leaves uh, February 15th, and those, there's a couple little flights that transit through, um, you're not getting out of there. Mm -hmm. And and to me, it was never an issue, but I think some people, it could be a big issue. Now, there's other uh, areas in Antarctica that are, there's other stations in there, I guess, do other countries have a presence in different areas? And what you're referring to in your book mostly is the U.S. station at, at the South Pole. But there's other stations throughout Antarctica. Is that correct? Yes, there are. Uh, the, on the coast, there's many, many countries have stations, South Africa, Chile, the Russians, uh, the French, uh, and, 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 and in the interior, you have the Concord, a little bit, you know, you have things like the Concordia station, Don Fuji in the interior, and then the Russian Vostok. Vostok means east. Uh, uh, that's what the word means. But we, there are other presence, uh, but we are the only current country to have a station at the South Pole. Okay. So for Antarctica itself, who, who, what's the consensus as to kind of who owns it, if, if anybody, or is it this is a global territory, if you will, yeah. and it's treated as such, or, and not just in talk speak, but in reality, it's really a global uh, land? Question it, mark. it is, Robert. And, and that's the really cool thing about Antarctica. There's an Antarctic Treaty has all these signatories that have, that have, and I don't remember how many it is now. There's like 12 or 13 or something original signatories. And then other countries have jumped on, on the bandwagon and have agreed that Antarctica is, is the, the world's, you know, everyone you know, has it. It's, it's a world resource. It will not be militarized. And, and so far, so good with that. And uh, while other countries have a presence, there are a couple of countries that try to say they have a claim to Antarctic land, but most of the world just ignores it. And it, and it doesn't seem okay. like it matters. Now, what exactly, I know there's levels of security clearance and you were a Marine and then you're in South Pole and something's going on there. So what actually can you talk about in terms of um, what were you guys doing? Uh, you know, what was the purpose yeah. of the mission? I mean, I know there's, yeah. you know, scientific research and this and that, but what, what were you guys up to as much as you can talk about? Sure. You know, it's interesting. The, um, we work for the National Science Foundation and our mission was primarily science. The major projects down there, the South Pole Telescope, the Marvin Pomeroy Observatory, the, uh, the, the Aero, that was part of the NOAA, um, National Oceanic, um, whatever they are, Aeronautic Organization, and then the, uh, did I mention the ice cube, that neutrino detector, and then all kinds of different science in the summer. I will say this, military people do visit the place, we get out there, it's, you know, the military does support us, and my guess is somewhere there's a, you know, something going on, the military at least knows we're there, um, I, other than the interaction I would have with them when they would visit, uh, they weren't they, were, they weren't giving me any information on any kind of Antarctic missions, but I think they have knowledge of the place and they probably have their own plans. I got to ask you like the elephant in the room, because I do a lot of reading, a lot of research and talk to a lot of different guests. And, you know, let's start here. Admiral Byrd, he went down there and apparently the, the story is he he got his butt kicked by uh, kind of Nazi breakaway slash extraterrestrials who had technology and airships that were no match for uh I mean, he had no match for them with his uh, fleet and he went back home and basically said you know we got to be careful about you know uh other nations or other um uh, beings if you will and they can circle circumvent the globe and we can't do that right now we have to be careful so what's your sense and then there's been a lot of politicians 
that have been sent down there. There's a lot of a lot of politicians have gone to Antarctica. So people, I think, are under the impression that there's something going on down there. And you hear about these stations being built, drilled way, way down under the ice. And what what's I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you're on Guys Guys Radio. So I got to ask you, what's your sense? Yeah. What can you talk about in terms of all of that? Because, you know, that information is out there. Okay, I think the best way to answer that one is I was uh, a couple of months ago, I came back from assignment out at Kwajalein Atoll. Kwajalein Atoll is a U.S. Army kind of facility and it does missile defense stuff. And while I was there, I was eating lunch one day and a fellow saw my U.S. Antarctic program hat. And he approached my table and says, so you worked at the South Pole? Said, yeah. And he said, uh, can you tell me about the aliens down there? And I said, <laughs> There's no aliens down there. And then he said, okay, okay, can you, can you really, go ahead, really tell me about the aliens down there. And I said, I walked for 4,000 miles outside in the winter, and I never had an alien encounter. And I saw this guy, he visibly kind of slumped at the answer. And then I said, but if I were an alien, would I tell you the truth? <laughs> and he immediately, he immediately perked up. So there's my answer, Robert. <laughs> okay, I, I totally respect that uh, because you know this just just so much, and it's like wow. So what was as you as a person? How did you change with your three years down there? Did did it have an effect on you in, in terms of who you are? Because you've been all over the world. You've been on these missions in Afghanistan and Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and New Guinea, and you know you're a world traveler, a marine. What did this experience do for you, or to you? Well, it showed me, it did several things. I thought I knew something about leadership. Um, and I learned that there was some more to learn with that. Uh, there was always more to learn when it comes to leadership. And before my first winter, one of the people that was departing on that last flight, a summer person said to me when they were leaving, Wayne, get ready for the greatest adventure of your life. And I laughed. I laughed and I said, <laughs> this won't be it. I was killed in the Amazon years ago. I've got a newspaper on the wall that says that. I've been around. Won't, it probably won't be the South Pole. I found out, and it was in its own way, it was a great adventure, particularly with the leadership angle. And I, and I, and I learned a lot about, about people and about particularly uh, people that are in isolation and how they that effect. And I learned how important it was to be a good leader and to care about these people. And to be a good leader, one must care more about their people than they do themselves. That's a difficult thing for many people. It wasn't so much for me, but it, it is a difficult thing for any leader to come to that point where their life comes first. They matter more than you do. That's something that I that I that I learned and it, I, it came home over and over and over. Um, I I, I it put me in a situation of isolation, which I'd never been in quite like that. And I did find out that I like isolation. I like to be alone. Uh, I love being around my crews, but that, 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 that intense isolation down there showed me that I really do enjoy isolation. And I also do, uh, there was nothing like being the leader of those wonderful men and women at the South Pole, being the honor that I had, being their leader. And mm -hmm. that's something that I'll never forget. It's with me all the time. So Wayne, did you have a completely different cruise those three years? Was, was there was it all turned over? And uh, and and do you stay in touch, or do any of the folks who went through these missions stay in touch with each other? Oh yeah, fantastic. Uh, the crews mostly change out. So so this is the deal. The way it works is. Uh, each year, there's a new crew that comes in. Many will come in during the summer. They'll spend the entire summer, a new winter crew. They'll spend the entire summer, and then they'll spend the entire winter. So most crew members uh, will spend a year at the South Pole, the winter over crew members. So since 1957, there's been new crews every year. Every crew has a photo on the wall, which is a magnificent thing to have your photo on that wall. Uh, the crews change. There are people who will who will come back. There's people who will do a back to back winter. They finish one, they go home for a few weeks, they come back. Uh, I ended up being the first winter manager in history to do three winters. Uh, in 65 years, only two others had done two winters, and I know why that is now because it's a very difficult job. Now, the record I'm nowhere near that. The record for some winters is like 15 that was done by a 
uh, one of the German scientists, and then he was followed with another scientist at 14. Unfortunately, he recently passed away. And then it drops back to like six winners or something like that. But those that's a different situation that they're in than what you are in as the station leader. And there's some, some as I, I don't want to embarrass anybody, so I didn't put a lot of facts. But there's been some past years where the station leaders had a really hard time and, and some terrible things happened. And so um, uh, I was always conscious of that, but I was the first to do three and uh, very appreciative of, of, of it, the records. Those kind of things mean nothing to me, but it is interesting that most all in 65 years that only two others have done two, done two winners. And I think it's a really difficult job. My hat's off to anybody that attempts it. You know, it's not easy to do. Now, uh, was in terms of fraternization, when you have men and women or men and men and women and women, whatever the preference is, you're going to have some type of spark between people uh, and you're down there in the dark for a couple of months. How did you manage uh, fraternization and uh, did it go on? Uh, was it discouraged? Yeah. Did people have to sign off like they're not going to do any of that stuff? Or, and if so, did they do it anyway? I mean, there must have been some stuff going on. Robert, there was, and I touch on it in my book. I try not to embarrass too many people sure. because the people will find it fascinating. Uh, the fact is, if it comes to matters of the heart, that is one of the most difficult things for a leader to deal with, um, to tell someone that, hey, they're out of line with the relationship. And I had to do it uh, uh, not often. Uh, it wasn't something that uh, my, my members are pretty cool, but there is no, there is total fragmentation. Anybody that wants to, do whatever they want to do. And that was, you know, without getting into it, past leaders have done that. And that to me, this is, is a thing that has caused some of the demise as far as the leaders down there that decided they were going to establish relationships with crew members as the station leader. It's difficult to do. Uh, on my crews, they did, they, they coupled up fast. Uh, there's some horrifying stories that have happened in the years. It's a story of a, a man and a woman who, who went down there married and ended up splitting up in the middle right. of the year. And the woman found another boyfriend and moved into his room. Oh Think how, <laughs> and wow. the, the, it was ugly. So there's been some ugly situations. You manage it the best you can, but matters of the heart, you know, are, are really difficult to control. You get into passions and such. So with your crew down there, I've got to think that a, a good, and it, I think you mentioned this in the book, a good portion of the crew is just to make sure things keep humming along. You need a plumber, you need a mechanic, you need a cook, you need people to, uh, you know, to, to cl keep cleaning up and stuff like that. How, what portion of your crew is, is, does with just the daily living logistics versus doing the science and the research? Yeah. Yeah. Out of 42, you'd have eight that are true scientists that that, that are uh, that are uh, that are actually committed to their the science projects. Then there's two others who are, who work with the, the main group, but they do science interface. They also do science. So you've got about 25% that are doing science, and you've got the rest that are doing support duties, which are very very important down there. Um, you know the maintenance people that are keeping everybody alive, keeping the station operating, the medical people, the doctor, the PA, the nurse practitioner. That are that are you know giving the best medical care they can, and dentistry, if they have to, as a medical doctor, which is something to be seen, um, and then the IT people and the supply people and the food service people, magnificent what they do as far as what the, the products that they put out there, you know. So you've got this this captive little group, and you asked earlier about staying in touch. We do. In fact, every uh, South Pole winner over has a number. I have a ring that has a number. On. My number is 1522, but we all have numbers. And there are uh, about 1,600 of us now that have at the South Pole and over 5,000 climb Mount Everest. So we're a small group. We do stay in contact. There's Facebook pages for us and things. We get together from time to time. And uh, it is a small, exclusive little community that I'm proud to be a part of. Yeah, amazing, amazing. The name of the book is Cold Wayne L. White, my guest on Guys Guys Radio. Just a few more questions about his three winters at the South Pole. I guess number one is, what would be the top three qualifications you would look for in an individual who wants to go on one of these missions with you? Okay, uh, the first would be that they are proficient in, in what they do, that they're very good at it. Whether okay. they're a plumber or whether they're BMF, they should be the best of the best. Secondly, that they love what they do, that they love what they do, that it matters to them, 
you know, that they can, that they have these skills. There's some people that are quite skilled that don't necessarily care so much about what they do. They do it for a livelihood. But I have, we found that people that really love what they do, they're a plumber. They love plumbing problems because um, this is no, you know, just use a plunger in the toilet kind of a plumbing thing. They're, they're doing valves and fuel lines in the power plant, things like that. Are plumbers. Anyway, those things. And then the third, of course, which is just as important, would be their ability to get along with people. And so what we're looking for, what we were looking for, what I was looking for, were men and women that were self-aware, that understood how they're being impacted others, that would give people a break, that generally cared about people, that you know weren't total narcissists. Um, and, and there's many people out there that, mm. that, that can do that. Overall, what were the, the same, same type of question? top three challenges you face by being down there as a, as a leader and as a human being for the three, the, the three uh, uh, um, journeys that you made there? Well, I'd say first with the ch main challenge was hiring and putting together that crew in the first okay. place. All the interviews you go through, um, it's and then and then the, the, the sad stories. You interview someone, you like them a lot, you offer the job, and then something happens. They don't make the medical exam, and then you lose them. And you're super excited about getting a certain kind of person, um, and then putting them through the, the training afterwards, the team building, the fire training, the medical training. That's a heck of a challenge that you have to you know that you have to surmount before you go to the airport, fly with that crew down to the South Pole. Um, after that, you know. I don't know. I, I, I don't, it wasn't very difficult for me for the most part. I would say, you know, so I can't say there were any real challenges. It, it seemed to really fit my personality. The crews treated me with great respect. And that was something that I, that I, um, I enjoyed it and I kind of used it. I, I, I kept a gulf between them and myself, which was for their own good, not mine, but theirs. I was never just another crew member. I'd been around the world. I'd done a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And that worked and it, and it was better for them. So that, that's kind of how it worked for me. It wasn't okay. hard. All right. Wayne Wonderful. L. White, my special guest on Guys, Guys Radio. The name of the book is Cold Three Winters at the South Pole. Last question for you, Wayne. Would you go back? I'd go back in a heartbeat. And I, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> I'm done. You know, I'm done. But I was. I think about it sometimes. I've got all these other things to do now with the book. And I've got another book that I actually wrote prior to cold that I put on, that I put kind of on the shelf because that's to do with my contracting work around the world. 1,500 okay. people, contractors were killed in Iraq. They didn't come home and flag great coffins and uh, that. So I'm working on that. Yeah. Okay. So where can, uh, great job. Where can folks find out more about you and, and your book? Well, you can certainly buy my book on on Barnes and Noble or Barnes and Noble and all the any of the other uh, you know book sites at uh, Walmart. It's on. Uh, okay, great. The other big ones, all those things. But I'm I'm on Facebook and I'm my stuff is all public. So if you just Google Wayne White South Pole or Wayne White Explorer, a lot of kind of fun stuff comes up. I am not self promotional. I have to be with this book in general. I don't like it, but I'm here today. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you and great job and really interesting stuff. So our special guest, Wayne L. White, thank you so much for being on Guys Guys Radio. You're a real guys guy. I got to tell you that. You're a man's man. <laughs> Robert, it was, a, it was wonderful. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. If you enjoy the content and guests I bring you each and every week on Guys Guys Radio and TV, please support us by subscribing to our channels. Thank you.